the Missouri School of Journalism. Welcome to Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. Global tourism is a booming industry. In 1950, there were just 25 million international tourist arrivals around the globe. Last year, that figure hit 1.4 billion, according to the UN, making tourism one of the largest industries in the global economy. But in a growing number of places around the world, the surge in tourism is too much of a good thing. Venice, Italy has been depopulated as year-round residents have fled its historic canals, where they're now vastly outnumbered by tourists. In the Philippines, the once pristine beaches of the country's famed Borake Island were closed for months recently to allow them to recover from the effects of six million annual visitors. And in Amsterdam, the crowds are so bad, the Dutch Tourism Board has stopped promoting the city altogether and now encourages people to visit elsewhere. So on this edition of Global Journalist, a look at the phenomenon of over-tourism and how tourist sites around the world are trying to adapt. We'll hear about several different places on the show, but first we're joined from Washington, D.C. by Elizabeth Becker. She was previously a foreign editor at NPR News and is author of the book Overbooked, The Exploding Business of Travel and Tourism. Elizabeth, welcome. Thank you. It's good to be here. Well, first of all, we should say this is kind of a new phenomenon. Yes, it's... Um it's one of those stealth industries that seems to come out of the blue. It's a beneficent, beneficent from the end of the Cold War, where for the first time in modern history, all the borders were open. We had Eastern Europe, all of the former Soviet Union, Asian to former communist, all of, everything is finally open. And it coincided with a uh, technological revolution, transportation, the internet, and uh, and the economic change of um, trade around the world. And people realized that industry realized they could make a lot of money from what used to be a hobby. So it's now eight trillion dollars a year. Well, talk to us about how do we how do we define this phenomenon of over tourism? I mean, obviously, you mentioned tourism has grown significantly just in the last 25 years or so. But what do we mean by over tourism? It's, it's more than just long lines at Disney World. Yeah, um, I think the easiest way is to look at what the, the, the impact the industry will have on the places where we live. And that's when industry has the ability to come in and make money from everybody's normal life, intrude in that life, and essentially destroy it. So you have um, what um, one of the mayors told me in Europe, you plan a dinner party for 12 and 12,000 show up, and you don't make any money from it. And that's the other problem with over-tourism. Yes, there's lots of crowds, but who's making the money from it? And you see the reaction to that. For instance, you just mentioned Venice. Well, people aren't leaving because of those long lines. They're leaving because the industry makes more money from short-term rentals, Airbnb, from turning old pal palaces into hotels, and from... Um, turning your local green grocer into a souvenir shop. So before you know it, your life has been hallowed out. The schools disappear, the clinics disappear. And what used to be lovely about Venice or whatever we're talking about is gone. And they all say we feel like our lives have turned into Disneyland. Well, give us just a few other examples. Then Venice, it sounds like, is sort of the classic example of a place that has been sort of spoiled for the locals by tourism. What are some others? Well, in Europe, Barcelona is is a big one. Um, I think a lot of us have been there recently and seen the graffiti. It starts out with, um, why call this tourism season if we can't kill them? Barcelona is not for sale, et cetera, et cetera. And they've had a similar thing. Their Rambla section is now um, only 40% local. The rest is all other, um, the outsiders renting it out. The mayor is trying to close down the illegal rentals and she's having a hard time. They're 50,000. She was sued by Airbnb. She's got a cruise ship problem. Cruise ships are probably one of the biggest problems in that they're floating hotels. So thousands of passengers descend on a destination. They spend very little money because they eat all their meals on that cruise ship and then they leave and it's up to the city to clean up after them and the residents are furious and again if you if you want to sell more than a cup of coffee and a t-shirt you don't want all those passengers so it's a it's an attempt to one tell the industry 
you have to think of the locals first to tame it and then to make sure that um, that the locals are making money from this, not some um, corporate headquarters. Well, your book, it came out in 2013, and it seems that this issue has even changed just in the last few years. I mean, what what what's been significant over the last five, six years? Oh, it's extraordinary. When when my book came out, nobody knew what I was talking about. Um, it's I, your other guests are going to give you tons of, of examples, but one, it's the fact that um, it's taken so long for a place to realize they have to regulate tourism. Before, when my book came out, most of the destinations simply thought more tourists equal more money. You mentioned Amsterdam. Well, Mexico, the entire country has closed their Bureau of Tourism and are using the money they used to have to build a light rail system because they figured that's the way, best way to tame tourism. Short-term rentals has exploded. That's been another big issue. And as I said, cruise ships are the fastest growing industry, and that's causing problems. And um, this is coincidental to climate crisis. All if, if the tourism industry was a country, they'd be responsible for 9% of greenhouse gases. Uh, flight shaming is huge now. Um, half of the greenhouse gases come from airplanes. So you have the, the volume in the destination, you have the effect on on um, climate, and you also have habitat destruction. All those cool beach resorts used to be often protected. The wonderful mountain places you want to go to, they're crowded. Remember the picture of Mount Everest this year? Why do we have a deathly uh, crisis of, of um, climbers can't move one way or the other, and they literally died on Mount Everest. Well, you mentioned you mentioned a number of places where this problem has, you know, basically ca- caused havoc. What are some places that have managed this well? Well, right next to Nepal, home of Mount Everest, is Bhutan, and that Himalayan nation um, realized from the get-go, very very smart leadership, that this was an industry; it wasn't a pastime. So, all of the visas are. Um, they're they're careful with the number of visas. They make sure so many go to a backpacker, so many go to a, a high end hotel person, and then they get the money up front. So when you before you even arrive, you're going to pay some money, and they use that money to keep to protect the environment, protect the culture, and it's a it's a rather poor country to use for development. And since they've started this program, the literacy rate has gone from less than 10% to over 66%. So Bhutan is a good example. Costa Rica in Central America is one of my favorites. It invented ecotourism. Over a fourth of the country is protected. And it is a a powerhouse for species, species like butterfly species, insects all the way to mammals and that protection is fueled by smart tourism so it's not that tourism per se is going to be bad 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 it's that you have to accept responsibility and learn how to regulate it and make it useful for you and i would argue that makes it much better for the tourist well elizabeth becker thanks so much for taking the time to join us thank you i enjoyed this This is Global Journalist. On today's show, we're talking about the issue of over-tourism. So for more on this, we're going to bring in Lisa Covert. She's a professor of Latin American history at the College of Charleston and has written a book about one of Mexico's more popular destinations. It's called San Miguel de Allende, Mexicans, Foreigners, and the Making of a World Heritage Site. Lisa, welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. Well, it's a pleasure to have you. Uh, Let's talk about this place, San Miguel de Allende. Many in our audience may not have heard of it, but this is a small city in the mountains of central Mexico, Mm -hmm. and it's an absolutely beautiful old colonial town with cobblestone streets and a spectacular cathedral. Uh, And it's been there for hundreds of years, but only recently has it become sort of a popular tourist destination. Yes, uh, you know, tourists have been been going there for quite some time, but its popularity as a destination has really skyrocketed since 2008. A uh, part of what I, I argue in my book is the the World Heritage uh, designation from UNESCO, which happened in 2008, really kind of put this city on the radar for for people all over the world. So um, there's been a huge influx of of tourists uh, because of that. 
Um, and, and also some other factors. You're just showing some images of, of weddings. Uh, it's become a really, really big wedding destination for Mexicans, but also for people from other parts of the world who want to take advantage of the beautiful scenery um, for their wedding photos. And uh, the wedding industry has really changed the city, especially in the summers. On the weekends, it's very hard to get around. There are wedding party parades. There are uh, trucks unloading rental equipment and things like that all over the streets. Uh, the streets are very narrow cobblestone in the historic center. So it does become a uh, something that's taken over the city. And uh, as Elizabeth mentioned earlier, it's made it very difficult for the people who live there to carry out their day-to-day -day lives. Right. And we should say, I mean, I think there's something like two million visitors per year there now. But one other phenomenon that's interesting about San Miguel de Allende is that it has also become a big point uh, of migration for American retirees and expatriates. There's something like 10 or 15,000 expatriates that live there now in a city of maybe 150,000. Uh, so this, I would think, has also been an economic boon, but poses some challenges as well. Yes, it's something that, you know, that the expats make up approximately 10 to 15 percent of the population, but they also tend to be concentrated more in the historic center. So what happens is it, it feels almost bigger than that, that, a bigger presence than the numbers might even suggest. Um, it, it is a big economic boon. Expats contribute a lot to the local economy, um, provide a lot of jobs things like that, but it also has contributed a lot to gentrification, um, making the city much more expensive to live in, and it has contributed to a lot of it, expats, for example, um, also have investment properties for Airbnb uh, and other things that sort of drive other local citizens and residents out to the peripheries of the city. And, you know, as in some other places, have we seen that there's been some organized resistance to this sort of explosion of tourism there? Yes, definitely. Uh, there are some local groups who have been very vocal about, uh, on the one hand, preserving the cultural heritage, the architectural heritage of the city. Um, so there was one, uh, you know, kind of on the surface, a silly debate about switching one of the roads from cobblestone to like a a flatter paving stone to make it easier for the wedding parties because these women in high heels were having a hard time walking on the cobblestones. And so this local group was resisting that change because they're saying this is part of what makes San Miguel unique. This is something that people love about the city. We can't accommodate, you know, just tourists in high heels and, and make changes like this. But there are also larger concerns about the environment, about the use of water and how tourism is depleting or contributing to the depletion of the aquifers. Uh, and there's also this sense um, that, that tourists and expats use more water uh, than than Mexicans do in their day to day, uh, you know, lives. So these are things that local residents, um, but also you know broader NGOs have been concerned about in San Miguel. Well, Lisa, our time grows short, but I want to ask you as well about Machu Picchu in Peru, which is another place that has uh, enjoyed, in some ways, a huge surge in tourism. In 2000, uh, this ancient Incan city on top of uh, uh, in the Andes, it got something like 400,000 visitors a year in 2000. Now it's four times that. Uh, what are some of the issues there? Yes, well, well, Machu Picchu, they they definitely try the proven government to limit the number of visitors. So you do have to get a ticket in advance. Uh, they try to limit how many people are there during different times of the day, uh, and how many people can go on the Inca Trail, which is the the sort of um, hiking route that a lot of people use to get to Machu Picchu. Um, but even with those limits, it still gets quite crowded. It can be a little bit dangerous. They've had some incidents in the past years of people slipping and falling off of steps or over ledges trying to get that perfect selfie. And then one of the other larger debates that's happening right now is over an airport. Uh, the government's trying to build a new airport in the city of Chinchero, which would be sort of a replacement for the airport in Cusco, which is where most tourists currently would fly into. 
Um, and the airport in Chinchero has become a, a huge debate because of the potential environmental implications, uh, just the po potential for pollution um, and industrialization of this uh, Andean Valley that has become a, a tourist destination in its own right for people on their way to Machu Picchu. So there's fears about that enabling even more tourists to come and further um, degrading the environment. Well, Lisa Cover, thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Thank you. A reminder that you're tuned into Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. On today's program, we're talking about the issue of over-tourism and how crowded some of the world's top tourist destinations have become. If you're interested in more Global Journalist, check us out online at globaljournalist.org. You can also like us on Facebook, where we live stream, follow us on Twitter, subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, or see our videocast on YouTube. Up next, we're going to hear more about this problem in Europe from a couple of different guests. Joining us from Washington, D.C. is Frank Carlson. He's a producer and photographer at the PBS NewsHour. Frank, welcome. Thanks so much for letting me be here. Happy and, to be here. Great. And with us from Faro, Portugal, is Claudia Ribeiro de Almeida. She's a professor of tourism studies at Portugal's University of Algarve. Claudia, welcome. Frank, let me start with you. Now, you went to a place in Italy called Bagno Reggio for the news hour. Uh, talk to us a little bit about this town. I understand it's called the Dying Town. That's right. It's it's about uh, 2,400 years old. It was it was built by the Etrus Etruscans, and and it um, it's it's built on a very unstable land. It's called tuff, and it's it the land around it has essentially fallen away over over centuries. So that you end up with this kind of magical kind of fairy tale looking place at the at the top of a mountain and there's only one bridge up there's no cars allowed the only way to get in and out is by this footbridge that's quite steep and and then the locals you they take uh motorcycles out that's that's what their garbage collection looked like as a man on a motorcycle and so it has this kind of um fairy tale looking uh fairy tale look to it and it's become this kind of attraction for people who go to Rome and go to Florence and they want to see this kind of fairy tale looking place. Well, I mean, tourism has surged in this town just in the past decade. I think there was something like 40,000 visitors there in 2010 uh, per year. Now there's something like 850,000 per year. How, how, how has the town managed that? Well, it, it's interesting because we, we went to this town because we were looking at uh, a series called Culture at Risk, and we were looking at threats to the built environment around the world and, and places, and, and that can come from uh, climate change, from uh, terrorism, it can come from uh, just, you know, abandonment, you know, pe things falling out of favor. But this place was, in a way, it was saved by tourism, and it was being destroyed by tourism. And, and what I mean by that is the place had, had fallen away, nobody was living there. In the 70s, some American architects came, and they kind of revitalized the town and, and they led to its uh, its rebirth uh, and now the families many of the old families have come back and built businesses bed and breakfasts and and restaurants and we we spent time with a, a son a father and son and, and the, they had both left the town because there was no work uh, and they had come back the son had opened a restaurant a very successful restaurant and and bed and breakfast and and he said this is the reason I can come here this is the reason I can live here is because of of, of tourism but his father his father had a different take. He felt that that the tourism was was destroying the the culture of the town and, and the and the the feeling of it. And when you when you're there, you know, there's only a few hotels. There's seven or eight people who live there continuously. Um, in the morning, it's beautiful. It's empty. And then and then by around nine or ten o'clock, it just starts flooding with people. But tour buses pull up from Rome or from from Florence, and and it just becomes unbearable. And, Cla um, well, and it's not. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, sorry, Frank, let me move this to Claudia Ribeiro de Almeida, because you raised some uh, excellent points here about this tension between the local culture and preserving places as their own distinct communities and the economic benefit that tourism brings. Claudia, I mean, what's what's your sense of this? Is I mean, is some of this just sour grapes from people who aren't getting some economic benefit out of out of the number of tourists that are descending on some of these places? Okay, here. Well, I live in Yalgarve, as you know, I live in a, a tourism destination where uh, many people live from tourism, as you can imagine. Uh, 
Um, but we are dealing with this type of uh, issues all over Europe when we have, as we have seen in the other examples that the other uh, interviewers uh, told, uh, we have several examples in Europe. Um, in Portugal, we are uh, looking for this problem as uh, with, with, uh, with a lot of care. Even today, we had the announcement of the mayor of Lisbon that now they are going to have a special regulation for local accommodation in the city, in the city center, in the whole city center. So uh, Portugal is looking for this with a lot of care and uh, concern, as you can imagine. Well, what are some, Claudia, what are some pl other places in Europe? We've talked about Barcelona. We've talked about uh, uh, Venice. What are some other places in Europe uh, that places, are particularly problematic? Dubrovnik, for example, it's one of the examples. And uh, I recently Dubrovnik, have... This, this is the walled town in Croatia where Game of Thrones was shot. Is that right? Yeah. And also you have, uh, for example, the island of Malta which is a very, very nice island, which uh, I love. And uh, the last time that I've been there, I saw a lot of tourism and uh, it was uh, the crowded, uh, Valletta was crowded of people, mainly because of the cruises. When they stop there, people stay in Valletta area for several hours and everything is crowded of people and it's very problematic for them as, at the moment. But I think we can add also here some another issue which is uh, very important, which is accessibility, mainly the ones by air. The airlines, low-cost carriers brought people from all over Europe and people go in a, a cheap fare to, for a weekend or something. And I think this is one of the, one of the issues also that uh, provoked uh, or can had this over tourism in several areas because now they have direct routes to them. Yeah, well, sure. But I mean, uh, at the same time, Claudia, I mean, this is a great boon for the tourists themselves because you have the opportunity to travel to places that your parents or grandparents maybe never could have. But if I could turn this back to Frank Carlson, I mean, a lot of the growth here, I mean, it has been fueled in part by cheap airfares to a number of these destinations. But a lot of the growth has also come from Chinese tourists. And as China has gotten wealthier, there's many, many more China. I think there's something like 150 million foreign tourist visits by Chinese tourists last year. That's also fueling uh, just a great increase in the number of visitors at sites like Bagno Regio uh, and others in Europe. That's right. And, you know, I, I lived in China for, for two years in Beijing, and, and, and this was back in 2005 leading up to the Olympics. And even then, I was as I would travel around China, I was seeing some of the same issues playing out internally with, within China. There was, you know, suddenly hundreds of millions of people who could who had disposable income, who who could travel for the first time, and, and the culture of travel wasn't wasn't quite there. And 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 in Chivita, you saw this this playing out where, you know, it's it's cutting in front of lines, it's issues with bathrooms, it's issue with waiting, and and, and there's just a whole set of of of, uh, of ethics that go around travel and and how to be a conscious traveler that that haven't quite uh, developed. I think they are developing in China, but it, but it's taking time. Uh, you know, to the to the economics, Chivita, the binary ratio, they, you know, years ago, as you said, in 2010, it was around 40,000 people a year. By 2015, it was around 500,000. And, and even more recently, it's, it's, it's almost, um, you know, 850,000. They've started make, forcing people to pay for uh, entrance and, and the okay, they've so eliminated there's an entrance fee just to get into the town. Just to get into the town. I mean, it's not a big town. It's, it, but they're charging people, and it was at the time when I was there, it was around a dollar fifty-two euros, uh, two dollars uh, to enter, and and that had eliminated the tax, the, almost all the taxes for the town. So, you know, the mayor was saying this is a, a great boon to the people, where the lower, you know, people, especially people without means, aren't having to pay taxes. So, uh, it's bringing business back. It's bringing all of these benefits back. But then you, you know, with all those economic interests come. The question of who's going to stop this, you know, when, when it gets to be 1.5 million, when it gets to be 2 million, like what is going to be too much and what is going to actually threaten the very existence of the place that you're celebrating and that's become this big cash cow for the local government? Well, Claudia, Frank raises this issue of sort of the ethics of tourism and responsible travel. Like what, what is that? What, what do you think that means? How can we as consumers be responsible tourists? Uh, OK, we have a lot of things we can do. Normally, when, when people are on vacation, sometimes they don't think about the, the problems that they are causing in the cities or in the places where they are. 
So, which is a, a very, not a very good thing, as you can imagine. And normally, uh, as tourists, they left uh, several bad things in the cities, like uh, pollution, like the garbage in the streets, or sometimes... Well, so, all... sorry, you started out talking about people's behavior. I know this is particularly a problem in Amsterdam, which is the scene of a lot of bachelor parties for tourists from yes. uh, other places as well. And in, in the Netherlands and Amsterdam, actually, they have a public campaign about basically behaving yourself while while you're there yeah yes uh i'm not quite sure uh i have been in amsterdam uh, three years ago and i noticed a lot of people in the, the cities mainly in the areas where normally are more uh, monuments and more to tourism places but uh, uh according to other things that we just talked i think one of the problems also of the over tourism is that people that goes that that the overcrowded cities are not only tourists; they are excursionists. They only stay for some hours, and that's why places stay so so overcrowded. As for example, Venice, it's one of the main issues in Venice. People are excursionists; are not uh, tourists. They don't stay for the night. They don't spend money. That's one of the issues that the other colleagues said as well. So um, in in Amsterdam, people stay in Amsterdam, and but they overcrowd places. And uh, sometimes uh, people get drunk and uh, other other things that are not uh, very regular behaviors of a tourist, as you can imagine. Well, well, Frank, uh, I understand that you also were recently in France. France is, of course, sort of like the home in a way to the global tourism industry there. But it sounds like uh, th this issue has played out extensively in Paris. Talk to us about what you saw when you were there. Yeah, you know, I was doing a few stories there, and one was on the, the, the Notre Dame Cathedral, which was burned in April, and, and, and they're now working to rebuild it, and, and it's slow going. But even, even a, a cathedral that was closed to the public because of lead remediation and pollution issues, it was still uh, shockingly crowded around the cathedral. And, and again, the ethics of, of tourism and selfies and kind of selfie culture were playing out, and and then, you know, just up the street at the Louvre, you have the uh, there's a 500th year uh, celebration of of Da Vinci after on the anniversary of his death, and uh, the Mona Lisa is become this uh, Mona Lisa, one of Da Vinci's most famous works, is not part of the Da Vinci exhibition for the fact that there are too many people who want to see it. And and on the one hand, that's that's a great thing that people are so interested in Da Vinci and and this work and understanding the context around it. I, I say that with, you know, knowing that that's not what a lot of people are there for. I, I went into the, the gallery where the Mona Lisa is currently being housed, and it was, it's a madhouse. I mean, we went in to, to shoot video of it, and, and I was just kind of shocked by how, you know, they've got lines going in and out. It, it, it looks like a ride at Disneyland. Um, and, and so, again, it gets back to that tension between, you know, this is a great thing that people are in, are celebrating this history. They're they're learning about it. They're contextualizing, but but it's also coming to a point where it's it's unsustainable and and that it's hurting the culture and the the object around it. Well, it certainly sounds like there's sort of a lot more work to be done on this issue. But we're out of time for this edition of Global Journalist, a production of the Reynolds Journalism Institute at the Missouri School of Journalism and KBIA Mid Missouri Public Radio. Many thanks to Elizabeth Becker, Lisa Covert, Frank Carlson, and Claudia Ribeiro Dalmeida. Our assistant producers this week are Laura Miseres and Ariana Suardi. Travis McMillan is our supervising producer. Kyle McCubbin is visual editor. Takia Thomas is audio engineer. Kathy Kiley is executive editor. And Travis McMillan is director. For all of us at Global Journalist, I'm Jason McClure. Thanks for tuning in.